Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Mordy and Glory video. In today's episode, we are going to be taking a look at the regimental attaches and bodyguards of the Imperial Guard. These minor support characters can often be overlooked by guard commanders who are instinctively drawn towards the more flashy units of the guard codex but that is a bit unfair towards them they do actually offer a wide variety of support abilities some of which are fun and flavorful and others are actually downright useful and maybe even competitive and with that bold statement mesa it's time to shatter their skies call an airstrike and witness their doom let's dive right into today's episode now, the first question that I want to ask and answer is, what are regimental attaches and bodyguards? Well, to start off, it's important to understand that there are five available to you as a guard commander. You have the Master of Ordnance, the Officer of the Fleet, the Astropath, the Ogren Bodyguard, and Nork Dedog, who is actually a named character. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that these are independent characters like your Caden Castellan or Primera Psyche that can run around the battle of their own volition and hand out buffs to whatever units they want. But this is not the case. In fact, you need to attach all of your advisors or bodyguards to other officer units in your army. One way of thinking about them is they are essentially upgrades for another officer's squad that happens to have a model. They're similar to, but not quite the same as Armorium Cherubs for Space Marines and Sisters or Grot Oilers for Orcs. However, it's important to note that unlike those models in other armies, regimental attaches and bodyguards models aren't simply just tokens that get thrown away once they've done their job. They are fully fledged characters. They do come with their own stat lines and war gear, which in some cases is very important. So what units can you attach your advisors or bodyguards to? Well, the Mass of Ordnance, the Officer of the Fleet and the Astropath are all considered regimental attaches. That means they need to be added to command squads. This can either be a platoon command squad or a Cadian command squad. As for the Ogren Bodyguard and Nork Dedog, these are both considered bodyguard units and they can actually be added to command squads or they can actually be added to other free roaming officers like your Cadian Castellan or your Commissar. It's important to note, however, that no attaches or bodyguards can be added to named units. It would be awesome if Strachan could run around with his best buddy Nork Dedog, but unfortunately, that is not the case. So that covers what advisor units we have available, but what do these things actually do? Well, fear not, for this is a Mordian Glory video, and we will be going into excruciating detail on every single one of these units. But broadly speaking, if I was to give you an overview, regimental attaches like the Massive Ordnance, Officer of the Fleet, and Astropath can be considered support characters. Each one brings a unique ability to the tabletop, and most of them also unlock a unique stratagem that you physically cannot use in game if you don't have one of these guys on the tabletop or in your army list. Regimental attaches tend to be a little bit more situational, but this doesn't make them any less valuable. If you are running a themed list, for example, maybe you've gone more down the artillery route, then something like a mass of ordnance is not going to be a nice to have. It's going to be an auto include for your army. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have the bodyguards. These are not support characters. They are not bringing any special abilities or force multipliers to the tabletop. They have a very simple job. They are there to tank damage for the unit they are attached to. Bodyguards tend to be a lot more take all comers and there are a number of competitive builds such as the Dreadnought that relies entirely upon including something like an Ogren Bodyguard. And speaking of which, I adore these lovable brutes. So let's start off with these big lads first. Let's take a look at the Bodyguards. So let's take a look at the Ogryn stat line first. He's got a movement of 6, weapon skill 3+, plus, ballistic skill 4+, plus, strength 6, toughness 5, 6 wounds, which is double that of a normal Ogryn, 
Five attacks, leadership eight, and a five plus save. An Ogun bodyguard is equipped with a ripper gun, ooze knife, and frag bombs as standard. And this model's ripper gun can be replaced with a grenadier, gauntlet, or ball grimoire. And this model's ooze knife can be replaced with a brute shield or slab shield. And you can also equip this Ogren bodyguard with Bulgrim plate if you want to. The brute shield gives the bearer a four plus invulnerable save. The Bulgrim plate gives the bearer a four plus armor save, and the slab shield gives the bearer a two plus armor save. What's interesting to note about the Ogren bodyguard's war gear options is that he does not need to give up his Ripper gun in order to gain access to one of the Ogren shields, like the Brute Shield or the Slab Shield. And to be honest, you're really looking at those shields when you're considering an Ogren bodyguard. Remember, this guy's job is to tank a huge amount of damage. And so anything that can improve his save, either giving him a 4 plus invulnerable or giving a 2 plus armor save, is really, really valuable. A common loadout that I see a lot of people taking, and one that I would recommend, is you keep the Ogren's Ripper Gun. He's got an 18-inch range, strength 5, AP-2, damage to attack, which actually really helps boost the damage output of the command squad at range. But then you also give him the Slab Shield or the Brute Shield. This means that not only can the Ogren do some long range dacker. He's then half decent in combat as well because the Ripper Gun does give him five attacks at AP minus one, strength six. But it also means that he can do his primary job, which is adding a big old armor save or invulnerable save to the unit. A secondary loadout that I like for the Ogren Bodyguard, if you're thinking of running a command squad that you know is going to be getting into combat, performing that Dreadnought-like role of just becoming a brick wall for enemy assault units to bash their head into, then I like to take a Brute Shield and also a Bulgrin Maul. Yes, there's a chance that he won't get to use the Bulgrin Maul for a couple of turns, and that the Ripper Gun would have been able to unleash a bit of damage, but when you get into combat, you need a Bulgrin Maul just to bonk the enemy on the head and go, no, you go to sleep now. At time of recording, the Ogren Bodyguard costs 50 points base. It costs five points for a Bulgrin Plate, Slab Shield, or Bulgrin Maul. Interestingly, the Brute Shield is free. That's the one that gives you the 4 plus invulnerable save. So if you're looking at the Ogun Bodyguard with a Slab Shield and a Ripper Gun, that's going to cost you 55 points. A Brute Shield and a Ripper Gun will cost you 50 points. And a Brute Shield and a Bulgur Maul will cost you 55 points as well. Now, the basic Ogun Bodyguard is pretty good. It's not too bad. But if you want the Deluxe model then you need to have a look at Nork Dedog, the named character of the Ogrins. Now, Nork is very similar to an Ogren bodyguard, but he has a much better stat line. He has improved weapon skill and ballistic skill. In fact, his weapon skill is a 2+, which is just awesome. And he has a ballistic skill of 3+. He's strength 6, of his 5, and he has an extra wound. So he's got 7 wounds. He's a big boy. He's got six attacks, so he's got more attacks as well. Leadership eight and a four plus save. All of that improvement for just 10 points more. Or if you're taking an Ogun Bodyguard with a 55 point loadout, which are the two more common ones, actually only five points more. Pretty impressive to say the least. Now, being a named character, Nork does come with a set loadout, and he gets the basic loadout of the Ogrins, which is a Ripper Gun, Ooge Knife, and Frag Bombs. But he also comes with two extra unique abilities. He has the make way rule, which each time this model makes a pile in or a consolidation move, it can move up to an additional three inches. So he can pile in a consolidate three inches a turn, which is pretty good. And that will definitely catch some people off guard. And he also has thunderous Edbutt. Each time this model makes a melee attack, an unmodified wound roll of a six inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. Now, you might be thinking that is a hell of a glow for just five or ten points more. Why would you ever take the basic Ogre Bodyguard? Well, essentially, it comes down to the fact that Nork does not come with an invulnerable save. So any kind of power weapon is just going to slice through his four plus save pretty easily. But fortunately, there is a way to get him an invulnerable save. And we'll dive into that in just a moment. Before that, I just want to briefly touch upon the fact that whether you pick an Ogren Bodyguard or Nork Dead Dog, 
Each one of these bodyguard unit comes with three unique rules that they share. So the first one is Wall of Muscle. Each time an attack is allocated to this model, you subtract one for the damage characteristic of that attack to a minimum of one. This is really potent when you take into account the fact that each one of these models is coming with a huge amount of wounds. I mean, the Ogun Bodyguard comes with six and Nort comes with seven, which means that people can't just sling in a bunch of two damage shots against them and hope to just chip their way through them. No, sir, they're going to need to put some serious anti-tank firepower if they want to bring these big boys down. If they're armed with a ripper gun, they also come with the point blank barrage rule. Basically, they can shoot their ripper gun into combat and there's no minus one hit penalty for doing that. And the last one is the most important one, big target. Each time an attack targets this model's unit, you use the model's toughness characteristic when making wound rolls. And each time a wound is allocated to the unit, it must go onto the big target first. Basically, the Ogryn has to tank all the damage first, but which is kind of what he's there for anyway. But the advantage is that he spreads his toughness out to the whole unit. So... If you take a Ogre Bodyguard and you attach him to a command squad, then every single person in that command squad counts as Toughness 5 until the Ogre Bodyguard or Nork has gone to meet the Emperor. Taking all this into account, and these bodyguards add a huge amount of durability to any unit that you attach them to, whilst at the same time bringing a decent level of damage output. Command squads, generally speaking, don't do a lot of damage and they can be kind of fragile. If you're sick of your command squads getting picked off by your opponent, you should be including an Ogren bodyguard in there. In fact, bodyguards and Nork are fundamental for creating what I like to call the Dread Nork. Now, this is where we talk about getting Nork Dead Dog and Invulnerable Save. We've come back around to that point. A Dreadnought is where you essentially build an unkillable command squad. And it is nigh on unkillable. I have field tested these things extensively. I have had 10 Custodian Wardens go into a command squad with a fully operational Dreadnought. And they did not wipe the command squad out. I have had 8 bound go into a Dreadnought and completely bounce. In fact, I have had every unit in the game that I can think of go into one of these Dreadnoughts. And it just completely bounced off. They are the ultimate brick wall. Now, I have done an in-depth video on the Dreadnought. So I will link that one at the end of this one. But essentially, how it works is you take a Cadian Command Squad, which means you can put Cadia stands on the unit, which means you can give Transhuman to the whole squad, including the Bodyguard. You then combine that with Nork Deadog. So you, you, the fact you've got seven wounds and this reduced damage by one. And then you combine that with the fact that you can take a medic in your command squad, which gives the whole squad, again, including the bodyguard, a 5 plus feel no pain. So you have a unit with, oh, and on top of that, you give the officer the relic, the death mask of Alonius Pius, giving the whole unit a 4 plus and vulnerable save. Stack all that together and you have a Nork Dog with a 4 plus and vulnerable save, transhuman, a 5 plus feel no pain and reduces damage by one. And at the same time, if you're ever getting hit by anything that's less than strength 5, like a load of bolter shots, you're still toughness 5 as well. And if all goes to plan, pretty much anything will just bounce off that. And even if Nork goes down, as long as the medic is still alive, you can use the battlefield surgery uh, stratagem to get him back up and start the whole process all over again. Because Battlefield Surgery says you return the character on full wounds. Now, let me be clear here. If you are taking a bodyguard, the main reason you should be doing so is to build a Dreadnought. If you've got a command squad that's going to be sat at the back of the board, just supporting the units around them, then there's no real need for a Dreadnought because that command squad is probably safe behind the front lines, right? But if you need a unit that can just counter any assault army you should be looking at dreadnought they really do fill that gap that guard often struggle with which is they can take ground their infantry but guardsmen die so easily they struggle to hold ground you stick a dreadnought on uh, objective that objective is going to be yours until someone puts some obsec on there if i was going to be brutally honest out of all the tactics that we're going to look at today 
The Dreadnought is by far the most take all comers and competitive. I have used it in tournaments. I cannot big it up enough. It is often an auto include for me in many of my competitive guard lists. However, Ogre Bodyguards are not just for building unkillable command squads. They also have another secondary role, which is what I like to call the Scion's Loophole. When you're building a pure Scion army, you have to take everything in your army with either the Auxilia keyword or the Militarum Tempestus keyword. This means that when you're building a pure Scion force, you can take lots and lots of Scion squads and you can take Torx Primes and Valkyries and you can take Scion command squads but you can't take any senior officers. Now, the problem with not taking senior officers is you don't have access to real ones to hit. And as any good Scion player knows, they like their plasma guns. Dropping in a big 10-man squad of Scions with double plasma and a plasma pistol and a couple of melter guns really is just the bread and butter of any good Stormtrooper list. But the moment that you start overcharging those weapons without the re-rolls from a senior officer, you're just going to end up with a lot of dead plasma gun guys and you're going to find your firepower petering out over the course of the game. The way we get around this is we take a Death Corps Marshal or a Caden Castellan, someone that gives out re-roll ones to hit, and then we attach an Ogren Bodyguard to them. This means that the senior officer gains the auxiliary keyword because the whole unit shares all the keywords that it has. And therefore, by gaining the auxiliary keyword, the senior officer can be included in a Scion army without breaking the keywords and causing your Scions to go from being troops to being elites again. So overall, I hope it's clear to see why I love Ogun Bodyguards so much. They are genuinely fun and flavorful whilst also being completely tactically viable. If I was to say they had one small disadvantage, it is they are somewhat points intensive. I mean, Nork Dead Dog is 60 points and then to make him really work, you've got to start looking at taking certain relics and CPs to support him. So because of this, I do find that a lot of guard players, they intend to include a Dreadnought in their list, but then they end up dropping them because they want to find the points somewhere else for something like a Rogue All Dawn or an extra Mortar Squad. But that covers all of the big boys. Now let's move on to some of these attaches and advisors. Little side note here, guys, if you hear me refer to these guys as advisors or attaches, those terms are fairly interchangeable. The reason that you sometimes might hear me slip up and call them an advisor is because that is what they used to be called in previous codexes, and I am a little bit of a long beard. But I just want to clear that up now in case anyone is confused and wondering if there's a difference between an attache and advisor. No, there isn't. It's the same thing. It's just me using a slightly older, outdated term. It's an older term, sir, but it checks out. Now, to start off with, let's take a look at the big brain boy, the Astropath. Now, this guy is a Psyker, and he comes with a basic Guardsman equivalent profile. That is to say, he has a movement of 6, weapon skill 4+, plus, ballistic skill 4+, plus, strength 3, toughness 3, 1 wound, 1 attack, leadership 6, and a 5+, plus save. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're going, why the hell would I spend so much, considering this guy is 40 points or what amounts to a guardsman literally he has exactly the same stats as a basic rifleman in your army the reason you're taking him is not for his stellar stat line you're taking him for what he can add to your force and what he's going to unlock for you in terms of tactics and strategy specifically he gives you access to psychic secondaries such as warp ritual and psychic interrogation this is very valuable as a guard player. Often you will find when you are picking your secondaries in a game, you're like, right, inflexible command, got that locked in, no problem. And you're like, no, what? I'll take some boots to the ground as well, locked in, great. And then you get that third secondary and you're like, oh dear, what do I actually take? My opponent doesn't give up any good no prisoners or any good bring it down. He's got just enough screening where... Being able to retrieve data might be a problem. It's an aggressive army where taking banners is going to be very risky. I might struggle to get more than five or six banner points. God, I really wish I just had a Psyker in my force so I could take Warp Ritual and get myself an easy 12 points. That is the value of the Psyker. You're not spending 40 points on a Guardsman. You're spending 40 points to give you that backup secondary. And potentially, if it's part of your go-to game plan... 
you're spending 40 points to guarantee yourself 12 victory points. That's a pretty good investment. Now, there are many advantages to taking a Astropath in your force. Straight up, they are the cheapest way of adding a Psyker into your army. They are 40 points when you compare it to the Primaris Psyker of 60 points. Also, don't let their fragile stat line fool you. Remember, these guys are going to be added into a command squad. There are going to be four or five other bodies that are going to be taking the hits first before you give up your Astropath. And also he gets a feel no pain as well if he's in a squad with a medic. The Astropath, like all of the advisors, does come with a cool ability as well. He can do the divination psychic action. In your psychic phase, one Astropath model from your army can attempt a performance action. If completed, you gain one command point. Now on paper, that's really, really good. Just being able to take an Astropath and just generate extra command points is fantastic. The issue is that the psychic action has a warp charge value of seven. And in all of my experience using the Astropath, I've never managed to get divination off. In fact, you rarely even want to bother trying to get it off because typically you're taking the Astropath to get psychic ritual which means that for the first three, maybe even four turns of the game, that's what he's going to be doing. It might take you a turn to move the command squad into range of the uh, of the middle objective. And then you then start doing the warp ritual. And it's like, right, that's turns two, turns three, turns four taken up. You finally get to turn five. You're like, oh, sweet, I'll do divination. And then you just fail it and you never get the CP. So it's a cool ability on paper. But in reality, I don't think it really pans out. And this kind of leads me on to some of the other problems with the Astropath, which is that he is the most expensive advisor. He might be cheap for a Psyker, but he's going to cost 40 points, and the Massive Orders and the Officer of the Fleet are only going to cost you 25 points. Now, if you get to the end of your list and you've put most things in your army, you'll probably find you've got about 20, 25 points left over, and you can happily chuck in a Massive Orders or Officer of the Fleet, or start maybe adding some heavy stubbers to your vehicles. Point is, is that an off the fleet and a massive ordnance, they're fairly affordable and you can just chuck them in. The Astropath is a conscious purchasing decision. You need to be including him in your list for a reason. If not, and you don't have a game plan around him, he is actually quite an expensive point sink for what is essentially a fairly unimpressive psychic profile. And what I mean by this is he can only do one psychic power a turn. The Primera Psychic knows two and can cast two. And also, the Astropath has actually limited access to guard psychic powers. It only knows the first three powers of the Psychana discipline, unlike a Primary Psyker, which knows all six of them. In case you're curious to know what psychic powers those are, the Astropath has access to Terrifying Visions, which is very good, Gaze of the Emperor, which is just a bad pseudo smite, and then Psychic Barrier, which is okay. It puts a 5 plus invulnerable save on a friendly unit, but I actually tend to find that the kind of units I'm looking to put an invulnerable save on, like a tank, I can do the same thing for better with the Regimental Engine Seer. But honestly, the biggest problem I find with the Ash Path has nothing to do with its stat line or its abilities, it's what it stops you from doing. Which is, by including a Psyker in your army, you are forbidding yourself from ever taking the Abhor the Witch secondary objective. Which, when you come across those armies, like Grey Knights, like Thousand Sons, is just basically a license to print money. It's an auto win for Guard, because then suddenly you've got 15 points guaranteed in Abhor the Witch, 15 points on inflexible command and then 10 to 15 points on boots on the ground just locked in straight away from the get-go and if you've taken ash path because you're thinking oh sweet i'm gonna get warp ritual off well suddenly it's like a double doozy because you've stopped yourself from being able to take a good secondary with the pole of the witch and you're also very unlikely to get one of your own secondaries off as part of your game plan because well one ash path is not going to be able to mount any kind of credible psychic defense or psychic action ability against a full army of psychers with all of their psychic tools at their disposal. In summary, I find the Astropath to be okay. He's a 3.6. Not great, not terrible. He does bring some tactical options to the table and he can actually add a lot to your army. But with the high points cost and the fact that it can screw you over in some matchups, 
I often find myself leaving mine at home. But next up, we have the officer of the fleet, the regimental advisor with arguably the fanciest uniform of them all. Like the Astropath, this fancy lad comes with a standard guardsman profile and he is equipped with a single mighty Laz pistol. So straight away, it should be kind of obvious that you're not taking this guy for his combat prowess. No, indeed, the main reason you are taking an officer of the fleet is to support the flyers in your force. You see, there's a bit of a problem with the guard air wing, which is that it doesn't have easy access to reroll ones because it doesn't get to benefit from regimental doctrines. Things like your Lehman Russes can get it via tank orders, gunners kill on sight, and your infantry, well, as long as there's a senior officer around telling them what to do, they've got the easiest access to reroll ones to hit of them all. This is a little bit of a problem because any fire support unit worth its salt needs some kind of reroll mechanic. I mean, if you don't have it, you're simply falling behind enemy units and competition within your own codex. This is where the officer of the fleet comes in. He has a special ability on his data sheet called Aeronautica Commander. In your command phase, select one enemy unit within 30 inches of and visible to this model until the start of your next command phase each time a friendly Aeronautica Imperialis model makes a range attack against that enemy unit, reroll a hit roll of one. I like this ability. I think it's really nifty because I think it turns your Valkyries into a genuine fire support unit and it gives them a distinct advantage over something like Lehman Russ. You see, the Lehman Russ, it has got a good main gun, but only the main gun hits on threes. Now, the Lehman Russ also has access to real ones to hit fairly easily via the tank commander but the valkyrie on the other hand has got hitting on threes on all of its guns from every single heavy bolter last cannon and the rocket pods and also it now gets access to reroll ones and i would argue that in some cases the reroll ones for the valkyrie are a little bit easier to get than the rerolls from the tank commander because you'll often find that because you're needing to stay in range, because for some reason, Lehman Russes, in fact, no guard vehicles have radios, the most fundamental part of any modern tank. But anyway, that's a rant for another day. You tend to find that your Lehman Russes are stuck around your tank commanders and they're kind of having to move around these inflexible blocks. But a officer of the fleet can point to an enemy unit, which is 30 inches away, which is actually more than enough distance when you take into account these smaller boards of 40K. They're not on a six by four, they're on a 44 by 60 for whatever reason. And therefore you will nearly always be able to mark for death the unit that you want to, but the Valkyries can be on the other end of the board. The Valkyries can come in from deep strike if they want to. They don't need to be anywhere near the officer of the fleet to benefit from the rerolls. So I'm not saying all of a sudden, that Valkyrie is better for their Russes. Not at all. Russes are absolutely the premier fire support unit of the Guard. They should be treated as such. But what I'm saying is the officer of the fleet adds an extra layer of tactical flexibility to a Valkyrie. It becomes more than just a transport. It becomes more than just a taxi for your Scions. It actually can do multiple things throughout the game and be good at them. But moving on from the Valkyrie and the Codex for a moment, it's important to remember that this guy pairs decently with some Forge World Flyers as well, because they also have the Aeronautica Imperialis keyword. However, Forge World Flyers are frankly out of date. They all only come with a ballistic skill of 4+. They don't have any kind of strafing run ability to increase that. So often they're hitting on 4s and giving reroll 1s to you that are hitting on 4s it's of negligible impact, to be honest. So I wouldn't really look at this guy pairing with Fortal Flyers all that well. The main reason you're looking at taking him is he's going to work with those Valkyries. But it's not just his data sheet ability, which is a fantastic reason for including the officer of the fleet in your force, because he also comes with a potentially game winning stratagem. It's two command points and it's called orbital interference. And quite simply, it allows you to delay one of your opponent's reinforcing units by a turn. If you're playing against a Dark Angels Deathwing player that has a big block of 10 Terminators in reserve and he tries to bring them in turn two, you can spend two CP for orbital interference and you can go, nope, that one unit can't come in. 
until the next turn. It can't come until turn three. Also means if your opponent is playing Iron Hands, another very popular faction, and they've got a drop pod with Gravin that wants to come in and Alpha Strike you, you can go, no, 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 no. You don't get to come in until turn two. I cannot overstate the impact this could have on a game. Many people bring Death Star units that they like to drop in and smash the enemy with turn two, turn three, deliver some kind of Alpha Strike with them. By being able to disrupt that game plan, you could completely derail your opponent's strategy for the game, forcing him to start having to adapt on the fly, which is infinitely less efficient than having a decent overall plan for the game. It also means that in a straight up firefight, it gives you an extra turn to achieve that fire superiority. If your opponent is relying upon those 10 Blightlord Terminators dropping in, and clearing away a load of your infantry turn two, but then you stop him from doing that, what it means is potentially you've had one or two or maybe even three turns, depending on who went first, of firepower that you've been able to put into your opponent's army before his vital linchpin unit turns up. Whenever I've used the Officer of the Fleet, the Orbital Interference Strat hasn't come up a lot, but once or twice when it has come up, it basically has caused me to just blow my opponent's army away. And by the time the special bunker busting unit turns up, it's turning up completely unsupported. So considering most games of 40k can be won in the first one or two turns of the game, anything that you've got that can give you an advantage in those two turns is pretty good. However, there is kind of a problem with this guy, which is that orbital interference is good, but it's situational. And as a result, this guy is situational at best. I've played a lot of games with my Massive Ordnance and Orbital Interference has only ever come up twice. And out of those two times, it's only been impactful once. It's a very good stratagem. And when you get into that scenario where it wins you the game, honestly, it feels amazing. But I'm talking about maybe one in 10, one in 15 games. That situation is going to come up. This links into what I was saying at the beginning of the video. If you build your army with the officer of the fleet in mind, if you are already planning on taking two Valkyries, then this guy is obviously an auto take because it means that every single game he's going to be doing something useful by his aeronautica commander ability and those games where orbital interference comes up, it's a Brucey bonus, but he's active every single time. But if you're not taking flies, if you're not really building your list around a certain theme or taking this guy into account, He's probably not worth it because he's just a little bit too situational. But finally, we get to our last regimental advisor, our last attache, the Master of Ordnance. And this guy fills a very similar role to the Officer of the Fleet, except for instead of supporting those damn dastardly curs of the Imperial Navy, he supports those fine upstanding fellows of the Imperial Artillery Corps. Like the other two attaches, the Ashpath and the Officer of the Fleet, this guy comes with a basic guardsman profile. So, you know, the movement six, weapon skill, ballistic skill of four plus strength three, toughness three, one wound attack, one leadership six, and a five plus save. And he also only comes equipped with but a single Laz pistol. But like with all attaches, you're not taking him for his unimpressive stat line. You are taking him for the ability he's going to add to your army. And his is very similar to the officer of the fleet, except for it affects artillery. So it's called artillery commander. In your command phase, select one enemy unit within 30 inches of and visible to this model until the start of your next command phase. Each time a friendly Ashton Militarm artillery model makes a range attack against the enemy unit, reroll a hit roll of one. Now, to be clear, the kind of units that this is going to affect are your field ordnance batteries, your basilisk, your manticores, and your earthshaker platforms. It's not going to affect your mortar teams in your heavy weapon squads because they don't have the artillery wood, which is a little bit of a bummer. It would be nice if he did give out real ones to hit two mortars as well. Now, let's get down to brass tacks. You are not going to be using this guy to suddenly make basilisks and manticores good. Those units are beyond help. The fact they only hit on fives when they fire indirectly, tacking on some reroll ones to hit onto them really isn't going to improve their situation at all. Where you want to focus this guy's efforts is with your field ordnance batteries and your earthshaker platforms. And this is because those artillery pieces can receive the take aim regimental order 
which essentially allows them to circumvent the indirect fire nerf completely, which makes them pretty good on the tabletop. In fact, let's just be real with each other for a moment. Let's not beat around the bush. Indirect fire isn't just useful, isn't just nice to have. They're not just good on the tabletop, not just usable. Indirect fire in all of its forms is downright essential to building a competitive list. And anything that can support that is a viable asset to have in your toolbox. For a lot of Imperial Guard commanders, especially those that have been in the game for a while, veterans of the Eastern Fringe and all that kind of good stuff, they're going to look at Morse teams because mortars are cheap and spammable. And if you've been in the guard for a long time, you've got so many of them in your collection because they always seem to come in various bits and eBay lots that you don't know what to do with them all. You've got more artillery and more mortars than you can shake a stick at. But for a lot of newer players, their go-to indirect fire is not actually the mortar. It's actually the field ordnance battery. This is because the Field Ordnance Battery came in Cadia stands, which got a lot of people into the guard. And it's also part of the Combat Patrol that you can get now as well. This means that despite the fact that on paper, Morthers probably are the most efficient choice. Whenever I look around the tournament hall and I see lots of fresh-faced new guard players taking their Ashman at arm out onto the competitive scene... I see more people with Field Ordnance Battery Barrels sticking into the air than I do with people running mortars. Small side note here, but this scenario is a perfect example of why what might be the best thing on paper does not always translate into what you actually encounter and experience on the tabletop. It's this whole theory craft, theory hammer versus actually playing the game. Anyway, getting back to the matter at hand, as a result of field ordnance batteries being very popular in the guard community right now and probably being the most common source of indirect fire that guard players are drawing upon, the master of ordnance is actually pretty relevant. And if you're a new player listening to this video or someone who just likes to run lots of field orders batteries, then you should really be including this guy in your force because he gives you those sweet, sweet re-rolls on those all-important artillery guns. But before I forget, the Master of Ordnance also unlocks the artillery strike requested stratagem for you as well. You use a stratagem in your command phase if a Master of Ordnance model from your army is on the battlefield. Select one point on the battlefield and place a marker on that point. At the start of your next command phase, roll 1d6 for each unit within 6 inches of the center of that marker, adding 1 if the unit being rolled for is within 3 inches of the center of the marker, subtracting 1 if the unit being rolled for is a character unit. On a 2 to 5, that unit suffers d3 mortal wounds, and on a 6 plus, that unit suffers d6 mortal wounds. The marker is then removed, and you can only use this stratagem once. Essentially, guys, you spend two command points to be able to do a mini smite bomb in a six inch radius. It's not too bad and it does have the potential of doing a lot of mortal wounds if there are a lot of units that are crammed onto an objective. But in reality, I think it's slightly too pricey for two command points. I think I would rather see it just do D3 mortal wounds to all units within six inches. Don't bother having it go and do D6 mortal wounds, but then just make it cost one command point because it is only once per game. So it's not like you can spam this ability with multiple massive ordinances as well. But it's a nice to have and in the right circumstances, it might net you a few extra enemy casualties. Overall, I think that the Massive Ordnance is a pretty decent character. He probably is going to be fielded in more lists than we expect simply because of the prevalence of Field Ordnance batteries. But like with any attache, he's only worth it if he factors into your game plan and if you are taking those units he can support. If you are taking indirect fire, but it's all mortars, you don't need this guy. And if you're not taking any indirect fire, then taking this guy purely for his stratagem definitely is not worth it. But that sums up our last attache. And with that, we have talked about all of the regimental advisors 
you can take in your guard army. Hopefully now you can see the value of adding these things into your army if you've got a good game plan to support them. But let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. What is your favorite advisor and or bodyguard? And what particularly cool tactic have you come up with to get the most out of these dudes? If you've enjoyed today's video, make sure you smash that like button and also subscribe to never miss an episode. And if you've particularly enjoyed today's video, then please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. By becoming a supporter, you will gain access to the Mordian Glory Discord, an online community with well over a thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got a tactics area, army list advice, painting, hobbying, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. And I just want to take a moment to say a big thank you to all of our latest channel members. So thank you to Tristan T, Christian H, Ike, Funbro, Archie N, The Chaparral Fox, Deo of the Gamer, Dylan Arino, George Catton, Jason Hoyland, Mystic Flair, Funny Guy, Jarvo, Nanaka Kitano, Joseph George, Miles One, Leafy Bree Studios, TS, Devils, Lorven, Mac Marik, Rafe Plots, The Consensual Gamer, and A Gaming Stuka. Thank you guys for doing your part. I also want to do a shout out to the latest Patreon supporters as well. So a big thank you to Michael Shulik, Cocaine Cowboy, Simon Vestile, Philip K, Ebola, Steely, and David J. Kelly. And last, but certainly not least, I want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier Patreon supporters. These are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. So a massive thank you to Alan Blunt III, Bon Bon Vert, Mark Panconi, Ridemaster 134-1, Ross Miller, Swordfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Diesel Fox, and August Varney. Thank you guys for being War Masters. Thank you for your incredibly generous support. It really makes a huge difference to the Morning Glory channel. I hope you guys have all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.